Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome back for part two of our video series dealing with the lab exercise Precambrian formation of North America. So we are now moving on to part one of the lab exercise. So part one is going to primarily focus on this diagram over here on the right hand side of the screen. And so these are the blocks of material which make up the core of modern day North America. You will also notice that below the diagram, you have a geologic time scale, which lists the ages of each boundary. And these are important because you will notice that a lot of the labels on the diagram also have ages associated with them. And those are going to be important for the questions in this part of the lab exercise. So for question one, it's asking you to look at this figure and list the Archean Kratons that constitute the core of North America. So when you look at this figure, you will notice there is a lot of text and it's in a lot of different colors. So you have black text, which is all in uppercase. You have black text, which is a mixture of uppercase and lowercase. You have white text, red text, and yellow text. So you're probably thinking, what does each one of these different colors mean? Please look at the description for the figure and it will explain that. So in the case of the Archean age rocks, you are looking for anything that is between 4 and 2.5 billion years old. Those are the Archean rocks. If they're younger, then they're Proterozoic or Paleozoic or Mesozoic or Cenozoic. And if they're older, they are Hadean. But you are looking exclusively at the Archean age rocks. So when you look at the diagram here, you will look around and you will see that, right, okay, Superior is older than 2.5, the Hearn older than 2.5, Ray, Slave, the Wyoming, all older than 2.5. So all of that material there is definitely going to be Archean. And so you'll notice that these regions of crust are all in uppercase black lettering. So if we come down here, it says Kratons are uppercase black text. And so you know that these Archean Kratons are marked out by this uppercase black text. So all you're going to do is you're going to find each of the cratons on the diagram and you're going to list them as part of your answer for question one. So once you've done that, you are going to be moving on to question two. So for question two, it's going to ask you to work out approximately what percentage of modern day North America is composed of Archean aged continental crust. So when we are talking about Archean age continental crust, we are talking about the cratons that you just listed for question one. And so you are visually going to estimate what percentage of modern day North America consists of Archean age continental crust. Relatively straightforward. Um, you know, there's a broad spread for your answer. Obviously, if you give me a very high or low answer, so if you say it's 10% or it's 90%, you're not going to be getting marks because that's way, way, way wrong. But there's quite a broad range which will you know, be considered a correct answer. So just try and make a, a reasonable visual estimate of how much of modern day North America is made up of this Archean continental crust. So for question three, you're going to be looking at the figure and you're going to try and explain how the distribution and age of the provinces supports the idea of continental growth by accretion so okay so let's look at our description underneath our figure again and you'll see the provinces are in white text and so it's all of these regions down here okay so if you remember in part one we discussed the idea of accretion as a method for growing the size of your continent so in accretion, you're obviously going to have the older material will be located somewhere, and then you will have younger material sticking itself onto the side. So I'm not going to give you all the details because obviously, you know, you hopefully have watched question, uh, part one, so you know the answer to this question. But uh, if you are uncertain, you can also go and look at the lecture associated with this lab exercise. You can go and look at uh, Archean Precambrian Geology, go and look at the lecture, and that will also explain the process of accretion uh, in the growth of continents. 
So for question four, it asks during the Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic, based on the modern orientation of North America, where was most of the tectonic activity located? Okay, so Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic, those are the key terms. So if we come down here and we look at our geologic timescale, we've got the Paleo and the Meso, so that's between 2.5 and 1 billion years ago. So on this diagram, you're going to be finding rocks that age in range from about 2.5 to 1 billion years, and those are going to be your Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic rocks. And so based on the current orientation of North America, where are those rocks located? North, the south, the east, the west, the northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest, where are they? Okay, so that's the first part. The next thing you need to deal with is during the Paleo and Mesoproterozoic, which provinces were added to the Archean core of North America? Once again, the provinces are in white text and they also are Paleoproterozoic and Mesoproterozoic. So you're looking for rocks which are between 2.5 and 1 billion years old and they are also labelled on the diagram in white text. Okay, so question five. Approximately what percentage of modern North America was constructed by the end of the Mesoarchean? So about one billion years ago. So look at this diagram here. Look, you know, find all the rocks that are older than one billion years, and that makes up your Archean and Proterozoic core of North America. And then, once again, visually estimate what percentage of modern-day North America is comprised of these regions. The final question for part one looks at the uh, Kiwanawan uh, rift, and this is an extensional feature. All right, so if we look at the uh, Kiwanawan rift, you can see it's marked out here in red. It forms this distinctive horse horseshoe shape. So this is an extensional feature. It's a rift. So the crust in this region was being stretched between 1.2 and 1 billion years ago. The area was under extension. And so the crust is being pulled and it's being thinned as part of this process. So the question asks you to look at this extensional feature and which it defines as a continental divergent margin. And it also states it formed in the Mesoproterozoic. So number one, when did the rift form? Look on the diagram, find the age range for the rift. Part two, which volcanic rocks would have been erupted into the rift? So in this case, go and look at your notes, find your notes on continental divergent margins and read what kind of magmas, what kind of lavas, would have been erupted into the rift as part of this process. Next part, what type of faults would have formed due to the rift? So obviously faults will form in response to compression, extension and shearing. So this particular area is going to be under extension, it's being stretched. So what type of faults are associated with extension? And finally, what would have happened if the rift had continued to develop? So if the rift had been allowed to get larger and larger and larger, what would have been the end result of this rift? OK, so if you remember, think all the way back to about 252 million years ago, we have the rift beginning to form between modern day North America and Europe and South America and Africa. So this rift begins to form and it eventually results in the formation of the, and I'm not going to give you the answer, but that is probably a pretty big hint as to what would happen if this rift was allowed to continue growing and developing. Okay, so next we are going to be moving on to part two. So part two is going to look at greenstone belts. Now, greenstone belts are extremely complex terrains and they are covered in greater detail within the uh, Precambrian lecture, uh, or should I say the Archean Precambrian lecture. So we're not going to go into excruciating detail right now, so we're just going to do a very quick overview and then look at the questions. So 
Information about green snow belts can be found in the Precambrian Earth and Life History, the Hadean and Archean presentation, and the associated YouTube video. So greenstone belts represent the first definitive proof of classic plate tectonic processes. They are the result of a range of different processes, possibly extension, most likely subduction. And we know that the earliest greenstone belt is dated to 3.8 billion years, and this is the issue of greenstone belt located in Greenland. So the processes that led to large amounts of oceanic crust being repeatedly thrust and folded into and onto the Archean crust are uncertain. So the process that forms these greenstone belts is not clear. These are very strongly deformed terrains, and it's very difficult to work out what happened because they've not only been deformed once, they've typically been deformed multiple times. Now. Based on the models we have, the, the cause of the formation of greenstone belts could be due to compressive tectonics, it could be collisional, or there are some models that suggest maybe it was a mixture of extensional tectonics of so the crust being stretched and then being compressed, eventually resulting in the formation of the greenstone belt. Now, in both of those instances, there is a period of compression, and as we know, when it comes to plate tectonics, compression is caused by collision, convergence. And so this would suggest that the formation of these greenstone belts is related to plate tectonics, more accurately, convergent plate tectonics. Now, we know that during the Archean, the Earth's interior was hotter than the present day. This is a combination of higher levels of retained heat from the formation of the Earth itself, and also the fact that the mantle during this time would have had more radioactive isotopes in it. They've been decaying steadily over time, so now we have fewer of them. But during the Archean, the mantle would have been richer in radioactive isotopes compared to the present day, which would have meant more radioactive decay and therefore more heat produced by that radioactive decay. So we know that the Earth's interior during the Archean will have been hotter than today. So the fact that it's hotter would have resulted in more rapid production of new oceanic crust at divergent boundaries. And this would have been difficult to destroy because once again when you are trying to subduct a piece of modern oceanic crust typically it is quite old it is quite cold and it has a big thick layer of sediment on top of it and those three factors help that piece of crust to be you know to be very dense and very heavy and so when it eventually starts subducting the you know, the density of it allows it to subduct into the mantle relatively easily in contrast this very young, this very juvenile Archean crust is not going to have a lot of time to cool down before it's being subducted, and it's not going to be building up a significant layer of sediment on top of it. And so this means your oceanic crust is not going to be old and cold, it's going to be young and comparatively quite warm, so it's not going to want to sink easily, it's going to be buoyant. And at the same time, as we've already discussed, the mantle that it's trying to push into is also going to be resisting subduction because the mantle at that time is also hot. It's buoyant. The mantle wants to rise as well. So this means that plate tectonics and subduction in particular during the Archean is going to be pretty tricky. And this is going to lead to a lot of situations where you can end up with obduction of oceanic crust. So the very confusing plate tectonic situation that was occurring during the Archean will have helped to lead to the formation of these greenstone belts. So as I just mentioned, obduction is one of the possible methods that can explain the formation of greenstone belts, but there are also other problems that will be making plate tectonics a lot more complicated. So in the case of uh, Archean convergent tectonism, we are also going to see failed subduction, which leads to obduction of oceanic crust onto the continents. We are going to see oceanic crust becoming trapped between the continents and island arcs during collision because it's difficult to even get the oceanic crust to begin subducting in the first place. So it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to imagine a situation where you have two pieces of continental crust moving towards each other and the oceanic crust in between them can't actually subduct underneath them. So all that happens is the oceanic crust gets trapped between these two pieces of buoyant continental crust and it just gets deformed and compressed as they collide. 
we can also have a situation when oceanic crust becomes stuck within a deforming back arc basin. So once again, this is like the region of a uh, sea that separates Japan from the mainland of Asia. So this is an example of a back arc basin. And you can imagine a situation where once again, due to subduction, you have the region starts to be compressed. So the island arc starts being pushed towards the continent and the material in the oceanic basin, that's a mixture of sediments and oceanic crust, gets squished as the island arc is forced towards Asia, or more accurately, forced towards the continent. And so this compression of this back arc basin, consisting of oceanic crust and sediments, could be another possible mechanism to explain the formation of greenstone belts. I will once again point out that this is covered in much more detail in the Precambrian Earth and Life History, uh, Hadean and Archean lecture. So one of the things that we do know about the Archean is that subduction zones were very active and they will also have been quite long lived. And so when we look at the distribution of greenstone belts, you will notice that they actually form these linear trends. So you can see here, we have the superior craton and you can see the greenstone belts marked out here in green and you will notice that they have an approximate uh, southwest northeast strike orientation and so this would suggest that whatever the process that is forming them is it tells us that this process was long-lived and it caused island and caused pieces of oceanic crust to essentially keep repeatedly getting stuck onto the side of north america in the same orientation so you have repeated incidents when oceanic crust is sticking itself onto the side of north america again and again and again and because that subduction zone which is causing it is long lived it means that the collisions are constantly occurring in the same orientation so they are lined up and if we come down here to this figure you can see once again in slightly greater detail this orientation so when we look at these greenstone belts coming across you will see they are orientated approximately southwest northeast you can see one here 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 and also there so this once again is good evidence for plate tectonics being a controlling factor in the development of greenstone belts so uh, in the aforementioned instances that we were just speaking about here the oceanic crust and sediments uh, would have been incorporated into the deformed rocks associated with the orogeny. And so when we look at greenstone belts, we see we have a range of different rock types present. So we obviously have metamorphosed uh, volcanic rocks. These rocks are going to be of mafic composition, and they are going to be metamorphosed to give us green stones and green schists. We're also going to have packages of quite quartz and feldspar rich rocks. These can represent uh, domains which are of a sedimentary nature. So for instance, once again, we have these volcanic high grounds, we have the continental crust, they're being eroded, that's producing sediment, and that's being deposited into things like back arc basins. So when the collision occurs, this sediment is going to be uh, deformed and metamorphosed, and it's going to give rise to metasedimentary rocks. And if those rocks are exposed to high enough temperatures, they will begin to melt, resulting in granites. So we will also see metasedimentary rocks as part of these greenstone belts, and we will also see plutonic and volcanic igneous rocks. And these probably represent domains such as island arcs, which are part of the sequence which is being stuck to the side of our continent. This goes some way to explaining what we see with our greenstone belt. So if we look at this diagram here, you'll see the greenstone belts themselves are marked out in green we have nice terrains in pink so these are regions of very strongly metamorphosed granites and tonelites and other felsic and intermediate igneous rocks these could represent maybe portions of island arcs which became incorporated into the greenstone sequence and we also have these purple regions that represent metasedimentary sequences. So these are sedimentary rocks that have been deformed and metamorphosed as part of the development of the greenstone belt. So let's come down and let's begin looking 
at our questions. So question one, what type of crust is metamorphosed uh, for green stem belts? Now you'll notice by the way, straight away, that sentence is really badly worded. I've clearly made a mistake there. It will be corrected for the lab, which you will find in the class Google Drive. So let's translate the sentence. Uh, what type of crust is metamorphosed to form greenstone belts? All right, I've already mentioned it several times. If you didn't pick up on it, please listen again or go and watch the relevant lecture video. Question two, the presence of which free minerals gives greenstones and green schists their green color? So uh, for that information, you are either going to have to go and uh, find the correct part of the lecture video or the associated presentation, or you can Google it and you'll probably end up on Wikipedia and it will give you the answer. But I am going to be truthful and tell you now, it won't just list free minerals on Wikipedia. It's going to give you a whole pile of different minerals. So you may not be able to work out which of the free minerals you are looking for. So you are probably best to go and watch the lecture video. So question three. Analysis of greenstone belts has shown that older examples contain abundant ultramafic volcanic rocks within the sequence. However, younger examples show a significant decrease in the amount of ultramafic volcanic rocks. So you need to try and explain why we see this decrease in the amount of ultramafic volcanic rocks as you move from older to younger greenstone belts. And you need to start thinking about what processes produce ultramafic and mafic magmas. So the first question is, is what rock melts to form ultramafic and mafic magmas? The answer is mafic igneous rocks. Okay, so we're talking about the mantle rocks. So the next question is, is do you need to partially or fully melt the mantle rocks to produce mafic or ultramafic magmas? One of them is produced by partial melting. One of them is produced by full melting. And to fully melt a mantle rock is actually quite a difficult thing because it's made up of a lot of very high temperature minerals. So if you want to melt that rock, you have to expose it to extremely high temperatures. So we have already touched on uh, the internal temperature of the earth during the Archean. So hopefully all of those pointers I've just given you will begin to guide you towards the answer for question number three. So question four asks you to explain why greenstone belts are typically located within regions that were once the margins of Archean cratons. So we've already touched on the fact that uh, these greenstone belts appear to be the result of compressive tectonics. And so what type of situation, divergent, convergent, or transform, what, which of those situations is going to lead to compressive tectonics? And then why would you find that tectonic situation occurring along the margins of these early continents in the Archean? Okay, so now we're going to move on to part three. So part three deals with banded iron formations. Now, banded iron formations are primarily actually formed in the Proterozoic. So they're not an Archean feature, they are a Proterozoic feature. So if you want to uh, listen to the lecture video for the Proterozoic, that is where you will find information about banded iron formations. So if I come down here, right, so these are banded iron formations and they consist of repeated layers of iron rich, minerals and they are those iron rich layers are split by layers of chert which typically has a kind of rusty red color to it so you can see as you look at this sequence here the iron rich minerals are marked out here as rusty red colors and the chert is actually this kind of tan gray color in this example you can see the iron minerals are marked out by these darker gray bands whereas the chert is marked out by this rusty red material so Banded iron formations are extremely important for geology. So they began forming in the late Archean and into the early Proterozoic. 
and they present a relatively limited range within the geologic record, with the majority of them having formed between about 2.5 and, and 1.85 billion years ago. Now, there are some even older examples, but the main period of banded iron formation formation occurs between about 2.5 and 1.85 billion years ago. And in particular, it seems to be mostly focused between about 2.5 and 2.2 billion years ago. Now, the sediments that make up a banded iron formation were deposited on continental shelf environments, and these environments were shallow and warm. And so why is this important? Well, around this time, as we are transitioning from the Archean to the Proterozoic, we begin to see cyanobacteria appearing in large abundances, and these are photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. So obviously, we know they are going to be producing oxygen in a very high abundance. And where are you going to get the highest concentrations of cyanobacteria? Well, you're going to get them in the most comfortable environments. So nice, warm, shallow seas would be an absolutely excellent environment for cyanobacteria to be growing in and living in. So this goes some way to explaining why we find banded iron formations associated with these shallow continental warm environments from the uh, early Proterozoic. Now, the cause of the layering that we see in banded iron formations is uncertain. The most likely explanation is that it is seasonal. So uh, during the spring and summer, you're obviously going to have higher numbers of cyanobacteria. They will be producing more oxygen as a waste product. And that oxygen is going to be an important part of the formation of banded iron formations. Then during the winter and the fall, when conditions get a little bit harsher, you're going to see a decrease in the number of cyanobacteria and therefore a decrease in the amount of oxygen being produced. And this could result in the sediments being deposited, becoming less iron rich and becoming more silica rich. So you'll see a shift from cherts, for instance, uh, in the colder months going to iron rich layers in the warmer months. The alternating layers consist of darker rust red to grey bands, which contain uh, iron minerals, and they are separated by layers of chert. Now, the formation of banded iron formations coincides, as I mentioned, with the rise of cyanobacteria, and these cyanobacteria produced extensive environmental change. Now, banded iron formations offer information for geologists about how the earth was developing during this time period because cyanobacteria are all important not only to the evolution of life during that time period, but also to the evolution of the Earth's atmosphere and therefore the Earth's surface as a whole. So banded iron formations are extremely uh, helpful things when you're trying to understand the science of the Archean and early Proterozoic atmosphere and life, but they also have a slightly more capitalist use and that is because they represent the greatest reservoirs of iron mineralization on the surface of the earth and so mining geologists like myself love them because you can go there you can dig them up and you can send the banded iron formation off for smelting to produce iron so it should be noted that due to the age of these banded iron formations a significant amount of them will have undergone some level of metamorphism and so even though we feel relatively confident about the method that led to the formation of banded iron formations we do have to be a little cautious because there could be additional information that has been lost. And so we may be missing some of the lesser steps required to induce the formation of banded iron formations. OK, so let's look at question one. So for question one, you're going to name two iron minerals that commonly occur within the metallic dark layers of a banded iron formation. So you have access to multiple sources that will allow you to work out the two most common iron minerals that occur within banded iron formations. However, I would strongly advise you to go and watch the Proterozoic lecture video. You may be tempted to go to Google and, you know, Google 
what iron oxide minerals occur within banded iron formations and if you do that you will probably end up on wikipedia and wikipedia will list multiple iron minerals so it may be difficult to uh, get to the two most common ones from that particular source so it's probably easier for you just to watch the lecture video and use that to find out which are the two most common minerals in banded iron formations now for question two based on your answer to question one to which class of minerals do the two minerals we were just discussing belong are they sulfides oxides or native elements question three the majority of banded iron formations were deposited between 2.5 and 2.3 billion years ago so this sits around the archean proterozoic boundary this burst of banded iron formation deposition coincides with the first definitive evidence of cyanobacteria, which occurs around 2.7 billion years ago. So we're talking about stromatolites. Now, we know that from about 2.7 billion years ago, when we start seeing indications of cyanobacteria being around, we know their numbers will have been growing exponentially. And by about 2.5 billion years ago, these cyanobacteria will have been having a very significant effect on the environment. And this will be what drives the deposition of banded iron formations. So what change did cyanobacteria produce that led to the deposition of these banded iron formations? They are producing something that is causing a change that leads to banded iron formations being deposited. So please you know, find out what that is. If you are uncertain, watch the Proterozoic lecture video. So for question four, before the deposition of banded iron formations, the iron must have been held in a reservoir. Okay, so banded iron formations contain substantial amounts of iron. And so this means that you must have had some kind of reservoir, some kind of location where all of this iron was being stored before it was allowed to precipitate out to form banded iron formations. So the question is, is where was this iron being stored during the late Archean and into the early Proterozoic? So you have three possible options. The iron was being stored in the oceans, it was being stored in the continental crust, or it was being stored in the atmosphere. If you are uncertain about how to answer this question, watch the Proterozoic lecture video. So for question five, the iron which was precipitated to form the iron minerals within banded iron formations comes from two sources the first was the weathering of continental rocks what was the second so to answer this question please watch the proterozoic lecture video on to question six the earliest examples of banded iron formations date to around 2.8 billion years ago However, we do not see evidence for cyanobacteria until 2.7 billion years ago. So can you provide a hypothesis to explain this discrepancy? On to question seven. So after 1.85 billion years ago, the deposition of banded iron formations ceased. So what must have occurred in order to stop banded iron formations from being deposited? So you need to think are the resources required to make a banded iron formation finite are they going to run out eventually and if they are going to run out what's going to run out and therefore stop banded iron formations from being deposited and finally on to question eight a final period of banded iron formation deposition occurred around uh, 750 million years ago and this is during the period referred to as snowball earth so the period existed between 900 and about 600 million years ago with ice sheets extending all the way down into the equatorial regions. So please provide a hypothesis to explain how Snowball Earth could have resulted in a recurrence of banded iron formation deposition. So think about what allowed the conditions for banded iron formations to begin uh, forming and then what triggered the deposition of banded iron formation. So you need to think about what's causing the, the requirements, the building blocks for a banded iron formation to begin to 
form and then what causes those building blocks to actually be turned into a banded iron formation and what is it about the snowball earth period of earth history that could have allowed these conditions to reappear again therefore eventually leading to the formation of banded iron formations okay thank you for watching this video everybody and have a good day